Okay, so welcome everybody to this session this evening, which is all about incident analysis and human factors. So what I'll be going through this time, uh, so for those of you who've seen this presentation before, because uh, so, we run it each year, uh, for those of you who've seen this before, um, there'll be some elements which are familiar, but there will be um, other elements which are new. Um, so what we're going to talk about, well, it's a, an introduction to the BSAC incident report, what it what it's all about and why we do it, why you should read it. We'll talk about human factors, which is something that's um, a relatively, uh, in the big scheme of things, a relatively new thing to come along in the diving world, although the, the way of approaching these things is not new in any way. And finally, we'll have a look at some of the selected incidents uh, from the latest incident report, which is actually the 2020, not the 2019. I've just noticed I didn't update that, did I? Um, but we'll be looking at some incidents from the 2020 report. So first things first, what if you've not seen the report, um, then you should go and uh, download it. There's actually a, a huge uh, back catalog of all of the reports over a number of years. You should have a look um, because there's a number of things that are in there. So first of all, what you'll find is a summary and a, a very um, high level analysis of the statistics. And those statistics are broken down into sections such as fatalities um, and incidents that might include decompression, so on and so forth. The way it's broken down, they take the, the foremost um, element of that incident. So a fatality will always come under fatalities, even if it did involve decompression. Uh, it's going to take the highest precedent uh, as, as, it's, uh, as it's analysed. So... The, uh, the report's broken down into lots of different sections, so you can start to see parallels or perhaps um, draw some conclusions. It also reports on the incidents um, as we go through the year, so we can start to see trends. So here's uh, what it looks like this year. Now, um, what we tend to see, and it's a it's a bit obvious, isn't it, really? We tend to see that the incidents tend to happen when the most amount of diving is happening and that naturally falls between around april and october you know the months of the, the winter months we tend to have less diving so we we see uh less um incidents occurring now it's a bit more of a confusing situation in the 2020 report because obviously we had covid um, and COVID meant that there was uh, restrictions happening in, and different restrictions happening in different parts of the country. So if you look at the bar chart below, you'll see um, that there are a, a number of coloured boxes which indicate what's happening in terms of whether shore diving is allowed, whether boat diving is allowed, or, or what all sorts of different things and it's also in uh in the sort of the regions of the united kingdom so england northern ireland scotland and wales so you can see um in april may june um there is a big reduction compared to previous years and it doesn't follow the same trend um and that's purely because, or one can draw a conclusion, which is that this is because, or one of the causations is that it's no diving is happening. No diving should be happening at least. So we can start to see these trends. What we can draw in that from that in terms of conclusions, well, it's limited. It's just, you know, that we we tend to see more diving, more incidences. That's, that's by and large, the, most of it. Now, when we start to see um, other interesting factors is where we um, we see what the biggest attributable factor is. So as we can see, the, the red boxes, which are the averages uh, from 2015 through to 2019, we see that it's usually DCI is the top one, followed closely by injuries, boat surface uh, activity in a sense. Now, if you look at the blue boxes, and we can uh, we can have a look at those compared to the the uh, the the normal trend, and we can see that there is a rough correlation now, because the number of incidents overall was much less. Any slight skew um, in the in the balance of those statistics means that it, the trend it's not going to follow exactly. Um, so, whilst you would expect perhaps. 
um, miscellaneous to have slightly more or something like that, or DCI to be slightly higher, it's not always going to follow that way. But what we can see is that the general trend appears to be the same, that the same sorts of incidents, the same proportionality is happening there. Um, now, the what we also measure in the incident report form is the, the depth of the dive in which the incident occurred. And again, we see that pattern, um, that pattern happening um, and replicating just in a smaller scale because of smaller numbers. But what we do, the, the takeaway point here is that um, we see um, that the incidents tend to be around either we don't know when the the depth what the depth was and that's because there's a lot of incidents that come without a narrative so that we, we take incident reports from the press uh, from rnli reports and such so that's what a lot of the unknown section is but of those incidents which have um a depth attributed um it doesn't necessarily follow that the the, the depth is the cause um, or indeed a contributing factor to it. Um, but it, it's worth bearing in mind, in fact, that a lot of incidents don't necessarily happen at the deepest point in the dive. So an incident may occur when you come up to a safety stop and lose buoyancy control. That's very, it's, it's not as linked to the depth as other contributing factors. So th this is just one of the many elements that feed into the the reasoning behind an incident. And this is what I'm trying to get to, that the statistics that we can see here, we can draw certain conclusions from them, but not always as clear as we'd like or, or that you might think. Um, now, we can also see here um, that the commencement depth, so this is the depth at which we know the incident happened, and there's a huge skew towards the surface um, and that, that could be for any number of reasons. So some of those will be because the incident happened on the surface. So surface people getting lost on the surface, getting injured on the surface. But also that's also uh, occasionally when divers um, may have an incident underwater, it may be unobserved until it reaches the surface. So it would that would come under that uh, that umbrella. So we can see there's a big skew um, on the normal average. Um, but when we look at this year's data, it's it, it's actually much it's much more subdued that that spike, isn't it? So um, what else can we see? So we can have a look at diver grade as well. And again, we tend to see um, the same skew, the same sort of um, proportionality with the average compared to 2020 figures. Now, what we can draw from this is perhaps a few different things. But again causation and correlation to very different areas um that there are a lot more perhaps sports divers and dive leaders so they they will be uh, statistically overrepresented when compared to first class divers now on the other hand it might also be said that first class divers do more adventurous diving so the risks or the, the chances of them coming a cropper are much greater so they will be statistically overrepresented again so it's a really tough one to actually draw conclusions from data at this sort of level we can just see that there is um you would you would expect perhaps that the advanced diver first class diver there will be a big drop but it, again it, as i say it might be because it's buoyed up by the types of diving happening we need to actually pair individual incidents and look at and look at the factors that go into an individual incident to actually draw conclusions um, in more detail. And then we look at um, fatalities. Now, this is where um, there's um, a, a lot more. We need to think a lot more about what's happening here. Now, last uh, last report, we had unfortunately six incidents, six fatalities, um, if I remember correctly from the report. Two of those fatalities were BSAC divers, and the remaining four were from um, other agencies or, or not necessarily reported as BSAC. Now, the average um, is around, previous to COVID, the average number of fatalities per year was around 14, 13. So um, six is, well, it's better, but in some respects, we've had a lot less diving happening. So 
it's only to be expected that there are fewer incidents resulting in death. Um, so, well, what, what can we draw from that? Again, it's going to be challenging to draw exact conclusions because also one can see that um, there's a fairly even distribution once every couple of months, essentially, um, that a fatality happened. Um, so it's also uh, worth noting that the incident report um, may pull data from different parts of the world. So whilst in May, um, if I recall correctly, in May 2020, th there were some limitations on the type of diving that we could do. That might not have been the case for where that fatality occurred um, in May. So it's worth bearing in mind. Now, a new addition to the incident report um, this year, I think it's this year anyway, is the statistics relating to immersionary, uh, pulmon sorry, immersion pulmonary edema. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, I'll talk about that in a second. But we've um, we've got these statistics now, and the, the the problem with IPO is that it can be misdiagnosed as lots of other things and lots of other things. It, it it tends to fall under lots of categories. So what's what the uh, the analysis has started to do is look at cases where it could have been um, a factor. So that's in quite a large number of um, cases. And then you can see actually the number where it's been definitely confirmed as IPO is, is very small. Um, and we'll, um, if you look at what the categorization, what we class as things where IPO might be a factor, breathing difficulties, confusion, inability to carry out normal functions, um, regulated doubt. So but this is me for brevity shortening things. Regulated doubt is essentially where you have a belief that your regulator is not providing you gas when it is. And the similarly, um, when um, someone offers an AS and you take it and then you again have um, you struggle to breathe from it. So you think that that is also broken. These are all symptoms of um, or 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 symptomatic of IPO. Now, if you don't know about IPO or what it is, what it what what it does or how it works, um, I ran a session um, last year and the year before on immersionary pulmonary edema, where we uh, we interviewed um, an unfortunate gentleman who um, who can who had it um, and their first hand experience on how it felt and what what it, how it presented. And it also talks about some of the physiology. So if you've got an opportunity, have a look on the on the BSAC uh, Catch Upon Past webinars section and you can re-watch that session. It's, it's worth a watch, even if I do say, my, say so myself. So now the report itself, why should we read it? Well, it's um, in a nutshell, this, if, we, um, if we look at the incidents and we... Um, uh, and we analyse why they might have happened or, or draw some conclusions from it. Essentially, we're going to, um, it's going to influence our own behaviour and we'll be safer divers. Um, it might help us within ourselves identify our own risky behaviours or spot the risky behaviours in others. And it's a chance for us to influence that. Now, um, human factors, um, if you haven't, um, had an opportunity to look at human factors. Um, these are some of the things that I'm going to be talking about with relation to the incident report tonight. Um, and there are already two great videos available on the BSAC website, one of which is by a, a gentleman called Mike Mason, and then there's another by Professor Simon Mitchell. Um, and what is what is or what are human factors um so human factors it's it's uh, they're the things that go into um where incidents occur there are factors at play so there may be external factors um such as you know if you're uh, flying a plane there are external factors such as the weather but there are also human factors so things that uh, that are human behaviors which will come to contribute to that um now the the idea or the concept of human factors has been really championed um, and and pioneered by a couple of industries. Uh, and the, aviation is a good example of that. Um, uh, medicine is another, um, where the the importance on safety is absolutely paramount, understandably, and the the opportunity to or sorry the the desire 
to not allow incidents to happen in the first place. Zero complacency is 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 absolutely key. So the, the, it's this approach has come out of those, um, and it's 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 actually proved itself to be very very effective. So, um, what as I say, what are human factors? Well, they're they're the properties of the individual or or behavior that that individual exhibits. So it's things like what we previously might have just attributed to a big catch-all of human error. Whereas we all know if you're if you're in a car crash or something like that, then yes, generally it is human error. But there might be a number of things at play because no one goes into a car accident, gets in a car thinking that they're going to have a car accident. Um, and so there's a number of things that have influenced your behavior um, to cause that to happen. Um, and these are what were essentially a, a, a human factors. Now, there was a 1997 study, and I can't remember for the life of me who published it, but the, um, the, it, that study reported that only f just under 5% of fatalities were because of one factor. Um, and interestingly, um, it also concluded that we can't actually eliminate all the factors that um that contributed to these fatalities we can try and minimize them as much as possible but we cannot eliminate the whole lot of them in one swathe so diving is inherently there are risks associated with diving that we can't quite eliminate um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit um now professor simon mitchell he did a presentation at the bsac diving conference uh, a couple of years ago um and some of the key points that I took away from that were essentially violations. So that violations are where we we go against what the normal rules might be, or the or common sense in some cases. Violations where someone does something like that don't usually arise because the person is um, incompetent or or in, unable to do the thing. It's because they've consciously decided that they're not going to do that thing, and the the reason why they may have decided to do that. Um, it, it is down to essentially corrupt motivation. So um, pressures, which might be put on the person themselves, or it might be that they feel under pressure from others. So, for instance, a really good example of that, which uh, we see a lot in diving, is not wanting to hold people up, feeling rushed, um, not wanting to be the one who costs other people money. Um, so, you know, if you've gone out on a charter boat, you've all paid a load of money. And then if you want to thumb the dive and say, I'm not going down or, or indeed, if you're already down and say, I'm not happy, I want to come up. There's a pressure not to do that because you're wasting other people's money, aren't you? There's also things like not wanting to admit that you've got shonky equipment or, or, or again, your shonky equipment causing one of the prior two motivations so holding the team up or, or causing the cancellation of a dive so there are just some examples of corrupt motivations but they um they're not obviously the the fully exhaustive list now there are what we would call error producing conditions um now these can be in the work environment so this might be the world around you. Um, so things like if you're getting distracted. So if we look at the uh, the example of driving a car, the work environment could be that you've got, you know, a couple of screaming kids in the background or something like that. Or it might be that you're driving a car which is not your normal car. So you're finding the, the, the you know, the dashboard confusing or something like that. Or it might be the your capabilities yourself. So you might reverse into a bollard. Um, and that might be because you're not that great at reversing. You you try to avoid it, or it might be that you are tired, or it might be that um, you know you you were communicating with someone else who was helping you back up, and you weren't very you were very imprecise with how you communicated with that person, and therefore you didn't understand that they were saying stop, and you reversed into the bollard. And then there's things. Um, probably one of the ones that we're most familiar about is task demand. So, you know, the time pressure. So um, this is this is very common in scuba diving because we we tend to work to quite tight deadlines and sometimes we get task loaded. So there's lots of things happening simultaneously, especially when we're underwater. Um, 
So th th there's that to, uh, coming into play. And then finally, there's human nature, which can be any number of things, but, you know, um, picking up habits, um, how stressed you are. Um, and it, a common one that I, um, I, I've seen a few times is complacency and overconfidence, where people think, I've done this many times before, and they just get away with it, don't they? So they just keep, keep doing that um, risky behaviour. So they are um, some of the conditions that might go into causing um, causing an incident or might be factors in the incident. They're not obviously everything, but they are examples of some human factors. Now, um, we've got a case and it's reviewed in, uh, it's actually a, a relatively well publicized case. So you can look this up for yourself and, the, the, you know, it's, um, it's a sad story, but um, essentially, um, Brian was a, a diver who um, died on a dive and it was entirely avoidable. Um, but there were lots and lots of things happening um, at the same time um, and all contributed. Each one of those factors themselves might not have been sufficient to cause him to die. Um, but when they were all combined together, they um they they formed a, the you know for lack of a better term the perfect storm so this individual um had um not got his o2 cylinder turned on um he had his handset on his his uh, his dive computer set wrong there was lots of stuff going on he was trying to use his computer uh, his camera um so he um he, he was task loaded he was pressured to complete the, the diving course because he wanted to get back to his family. Um, he'd been sat in a dry suit in the heat all day, so he really wanted to get into the water. Um, he hadn't done all the safety checks and the instructor wasn't aware of that. There was some systematic problems with buddy checks. Um, uh, again, time pressures, um, not wanting to let the team down. Um, and then some training um, back in the classroom, which might have been given differently um, had they uh, thought about what the implication of some of the instructions that they were given. Now, all of this feeds into something which, as a B-site diver, you should theoretically be well familiar with, which is the incident pit. This is just another way of visualising how multiple factors can come together um, and concatenate and then ultimately result in um, a, a serious incident and perhaps even death. So what you have at the top of the incident pit is minor incidents. So things like being uh, task loaded a little bit, wanting to, you know, do your new camera and being a bit hot. And then you jump in the water because of various things. You start to go into shock because of the cold and uh, all sorts of things. And then you get fear and emergency. And then that fear, as as the incident starts to progress um, and, and quickly becomes heads towards being irrecoverable, then panic sets in. And then, as I'm sure many of you are aware, when people panic, the first reactions that they, they exhibit are very rarely the correct actions that they need to take. Um, and by that point, you are well over the edge and you're heading into the black hole, which unfortunately results in, in this case, in a fatality. Now, as I said, none of these, in, none of these elements themselves, um, if they occurred on their own without any of the others, would have killed this individual. It was the combination of all of those and a lack of checks and a lack of... Um, of measures that allowed this uh, this to progress to something which um, resulted in this diver to die. Now, another way of viewing this um, is the Swiss cheese model. Now, hopefully um, this will render all right on your computers, but if not, um, at the end of the session, head on to YouTube and um, search for Swiss cheese human factors and you'll find very similar um, renderings on uh, out there. But what we see in the Swiss cheese model is each one of those slices of um, cheese is a um, a protection. Um, and each of the holes in the in the slice of cheese represents um, where the 
where the where that check or where that um, that barrier fails. So each one of those, it's a recognition. I'll just rewind that again. So it's a recognition that each one of those procedures, policies, ways of doing things is not perfect. Now, when they all line up and you have all of them together, with and it happens that on each one of those, um, the incident, uh, it, it, it passes through. Then it, the light is let through in this visualisation, and then essentially that's the lining up of all of the um all of the um all of the errors all of the factors together so um so that's that that essentially is um is human factors and what um and how we can think about them how we can apply them now what what i'm going to do now is have a look at a few real world examples of incidents from the report um this year before I do that, I really want to make this very clear. Um, when you read the report, it's really easy to act as judge and jury. Um, but please do bear in mind that these are real incidents and they occurred to real people. Uh, they might be people that you know. It might be people that you are friends of friends. Um, it's really important that you bear that in mind um, because the purpose of us discussing this today is not to apportion any blame. I can only emphasize that so much. It's not to blame people. It's not to say you did something wrong. This is to highlight how the factors, how we how we might look at the incidents and learn from them and realize what the human factors were that were at play. Um, it's also worth pointing out that the analysis that we can do, we can only draw information from the publicly available details. So um we, this is just to highlight what we um, what we can draw from a limited source. It might also be worth highlighting. It's not in the slides here. There are there are one or two incidents here that you may recognise from the media, um, and please refrain from drawing any conclusions if you think you recognise the case or anything like that. Let's keep this anonymous. So the first incident that. Um, I wanted to look at was a, a fatality. Now, this one occurred in May and it was a snorkeler who went out um, on their own um, and then um, was not seen again. Um, and uh, three weeks later, despite numerous searches from various parties, the snorkeler was located um, dead uh, and it was confirmed to be the person who was missing. Now, some of the things that um, we could think about, questions that we could ask ourselves with relation to this particular incident. Um, so this is something. This is a little bit about the procedural part of, um, of of diving. So we've got all sorts of rules that we have in place with diving and snorkeling to keep us safe. And if you don't follow those first rules, um, then you open those big holes in the Swiss cheese. OK, so questions that are not necessarily clear um, are, did the snorkeler have shore cover? So that in itself, having shore cover is uh, and dedicated surface cover is um, proven to be much more, much more effective than not having in the event of an emergency. So you, the likelihood of a, a beneficial resolution to an incident it's much greater if you have surface cover so did that person have surface cover did they have a buddy um did they follow the one up one down guidance with relation to snorkeling um and also did they have appropriate training it's also worth and this is again this is drawing conclusions and, and potentially making inference where we could we might not be able to make inference but if we look at the timing, this is May. So there had been a period of, of cold, inclement weather, potentially lockdown. Um, had this into had this individual been practiced recently, or did they go out on their own and were they trying to do dives that they hadn't built up to? It's hard to say, but these are questions that we can ask ourselves and we can th there is no answer. Um, not at least not from the incident reports um, uh, perspective. Um, 
but by looking at them and, and thinking of questions which might um, which might be pertinent, we can ask those same questions of ourselves when we go out and plan our dive. So when we go out and we go to dive uh, an area of the coast and we all go to snorkeling, do we have shore cover? Well, that might have been a contributing factor to that incident. So it, perhaps it's worth taking that away as a learning point. So let's have a look at another example. So this is a fatality with multiple factors at play. So um, this is a this is a real complicated. I've abridged um, the the narrative on this one quite significantly. If you do want to look up the full narrative, um, then you've got the reference number there, which is twenty zero five zero. But essentially, a diver's equipment falls over and breaks. So they borrow some equipment and cobble it together and then go diving. Um, but they weren't diving with their planned buddy. They were diving with some a pair of buddies, which they, they hadn't originally thought to do. Um, and then on the way down, there was a, a, some sort of wobble and they lost their primary, uh, but then it was rectified. So they continued with the dive. And then at the bottom, um, the diver seemed to be having problems with their dry suit. Um, decides to abort, and then things go really downhill, and and they fall to the uh, to fall to the bottom again, without a regulator in their mouth. When the buddies tried to uh, perform a um, control buoyant lift, they weren't able to inflate the diver's wing, um, and they um, they had trouble also inflating the diver's dry suit. They eventually got them to the surface, but it again it resulted in a fatality. I'm sure you realise that there's all sorts of factors going on here. So the factors that we might want to consider, but they aren't necessarily definite, but factors that we might want to consider, things like unfamiliar equipment. So it's it's documented that the diver wasn't diving with kit that was entirely their own. So it, it was that uh, a factor. Um, did a buddy check occur? Um, and if it didn't, could a buddy check have identified some of the issues? So the diver um, was, according to the narrative, struggling to inflate uh, add buoyancy once they reached the bottom of the shot line. So had they done a buddy check, would that have resolved that that single element? Possibly, possibly not. Um, they were diving with buddies which originally they hadn't planned on diving with. Was that a factor? Yes, it could well have been. Um, there are also human factors at play. So they may have been putting pressure on themselves to dive. So having missed already one dive, maybe they were really feeling pressured that they wanted to get the maximum value for money that they could off this, this excursion. They'd already paid however much it would have been to go out on that charter boat. And then finally, um, in this case, it's perhaps not a factor because um, the the the, um, the rescue was affected in a timely manner. But it's always worth asking ourselves when there's a, a, a dive conducted in a trio: is this advisable? Were special measures put in place to try and negate the risks of uh, trio diving, which are well documented? Who's to say? So. We can see that there's lots of different things, lots of areas that perhaps we could have learned from. We can't pin any one of the factors that I've identified there. They're certainly not the only factors at play. Can't pin any one of them to it, but they're all certainly areas where it might have contributed. And you should be asking yourself, have I done any of these things? Have I missed buddy checks? Have I dived with new and unfamiliar equipment in challenging conditions? If you have done those things, then again, you should you should perhaps think, well, oh, well, maybe this is this is something that I need to rectify. This is a, a behaviour that I need to change. So let's have a look at. So thankfully, um, that's it for the fatalities. I, I don't want to talk too much about um, about these things. Um, so let's have a look at some incidents which had slightly better outcomes. So. Um, this one is uh, a diver uh, went out with a buddy who was limited to 20 meters for whatever reason. It's not in the narrative, but they were just medically limited. Um, they descended and then they went over a shelf and then there was some issue with buoyancy. Um, and um, 
they realized that they'd exceeded their depth limit um, and then tried to make an ascent. So they made their ascent back to 20, um, but then they they had a wobble and then ended up, um, as as I'm sure you you've seen people do before, for whatever reason they've they've um, ascended quickly to the surface because of some sort of buoyancy control. It's early on in the dive, so they decided that they were going to have another crack at it and descended back down. But the buoyancy controls continued. Uh, sorry, buoyancy problems continued. And it resulted in them zigzagging through the water column for for a period during the dive. And then when they uh, they aborted the dive, eventually they got up onto the surface and then they had some of the classic symptoms of uh, decompression sickness. And they ended up in the pot for five hours. But then thankfully, um, you know, they, they made a full recovery. So. Um, again, we can ask ourselves a number of questions. We can think about lots of different things. First of all, looking at the date in June, were the divers up to speed following a period of non-diving? It could well have been a factor. Um, we were all out the water for a period up until then. So perhaps that was at play. Um, weighting, buoyancy and trim is um, is another one. So we just don't know the answers to this. Were they were they diving on the kit that they normally did dive on? Um, was there had they put on a little bit of extra weight? So, for instance, you know, I can speak from my um, my own personal experience that when I got went diving for the first time after a period out of the water, I think we'd all put on a few COVID pounds. So, I, you know, I'll be honest, I put in a couple of a couple of kilos of extra lead just to be certain that I sank. Um, so. That's the contributing factor, isn't it? Um, being overweighted, and that that definitely impacts on your buoyancy and trim. So, had this individual done something like that? Possibly, possibly not. But clearly, that there was an issue with weighting, buoyancy, and trim. So perhaps it was a case that that maybe they were out of practice, or maybe there were other things going on. We could ask ourselves what could also have caused the buoyancy and trim issues. Was it equipment? Was there a malfunction? Um, you know, if the equipment's been out of the water for quite some time, we know that you can get sticky buttons on LPIs, for instance. Was it something like that? Was there a constant slow leak making life difficult? Um, other things that we might ask ourselves. So um, the, um, th there was a period of separation where um, the divers were not together, if we look at the narrative. So were they in a suitable attitude? Were they facing each other during descent or once they got down to that shelf, were they in a good buddy position? This, you know, positioning is really important when it comes to making sure that you don't end up with separation. So that's that is a mitigation for the risk. So being in good buddy positioning. So these are questions, again, that we could apply and we could take some learning from this. Um. This next one um, is PFO. So this is patent foramen ovale. It's a, a medical condition. So essentially, um, a diver um, went diving and did what one might think there is a relatively um, conservative dive, nothing too, um, too drastic. But then once they got back onto shore, they uh, they started to show symptoms of um, a skin bend. Um, they they were put on oxygen and um, the the symptoms started to subside. But the, and, and then they were diagnosed that there was possibly, uh, you know, decompression sickness at play and put in the pot. Um, and subsequently, the diver was diagnosed with a PFO, um, which was uh, needed to be investigated um, further. And again, thankfully, ba based on the recompression treatment um, of a to totaling around nine hours, um, they were right as rain apart from the suspected PFO. Now, questions we can ask ourselves, were the dives conducted in a safe manner? Yes. I, I would say from what I can see in the details, they are. Um, so the question here, the learning point is, um, 
I mean, could this could this particular thing have been stopped if it was PFO that caused it? Possibly not. Um, but one learning lesson that we could take, and this is why I've highlighted this, one learning lesson that we could take from this is a familiarity with the um, with PFO and what it is, in case you're not aware or in case you've forgotten from your theory. Um, PFO is um, a, a hole essentially between two chambers of the heart. Um, this is absolutely normal and fine when you are um, a baby in the womb. It's it's there to help um, make things much more efficient and, and regulate blood pressure in the baby's lungs. Um, and this hole should seal up in the hours after or the very short period after birth. Um, but in around one in four people, it doesn't seal up entirely. And you can live your entire life without realising uh, but for some people, if that if that um, if that shunt between the two ventricles is is uh, sufficient enough, um, it can cause um, cause you to be much more susceptible to decompression sickness or decompression illness. So, are you familiar with that? Are you able to recognise? It's the same thing as with P, uh, with IPO. Do you know that? Do you know the symptoms? Do you know what can cause it? So, you know, one of the initial. Uh, and one of the most prevalent symptoms of decompression illness is um, denial. So denying that you've got it. Um, and it, that would be particularly uh, relevant in this one. If it was a more experienced either who this had happened to in the first case, they might say, well, no, no, it can't be a DCI because I've done some really safe dives and no one else has got DCI. So this is where PFO is something that we need to be mindful of. So that's why I've highlighted that. Um, another incident. So, um, a dive boat reported to the Coast Guard that they'd separated, uh, they got the diver had become separated from their buddy and was overdue. Um, so Coast Guard quite rightly sent out a, a live boat and then a chopper. Um, and they did, um, a search pattern, um, and very quickly recovered the uh, diver and recovered them into the lifeboat and everything was great the 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 uh, lifeboat took them back to the dive boat in fact and uh, they went on their merry way so the 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 lesson here is not that, that how the incident necessarily happened because there is no there is there is nowhere near enough information to draw conclusions on how the incident happened but things that we can take away from this and questions that we can ask what contributed to um, that successful rescue. So things like having timely procedure, uh, timely procedure in place for the dive boat, of um, calling the authorities at the right time. Had the Coast Guard not been tasked, and presumably there was current and wind at play, the uh, the uh, the search area would have to have been much greater and might have required a, a much higher number of resources to effectively search that area. So. So timeliness was there, you know, not refu not um, not delaying phoning or radioing for the Coast Guard. Um, the, you know, the, this is one uh, thing that I think some people may have is a fear of wanting to get authorities involved because they think it will probably be all right. And, and they, they tarry slightly on that. So that's another area. Um, and also, if we look at the lifeboat, they came onto scene and immediately started doing um, a, a very methodical approach. They did an expanding box search. If you're not familiar, have a, a look on the lifeboat's um, website. There is somewhere lurking in there um, some downloadable materials on how they do their search patterns. Um, and it's a really interesting read. Um, so they came in there with a, a procedure already in place. They didn't have to think about it per se. They looked at the elements of the rescue that were at hand and then applied the tools and, and dealt with it. And, um, and this is something that I'll come on to in a little while towards the end of the session. So what about this one? Cont changing conditions. So a pair of divers went in for a shore dive when it was flat, calm, um, and it was, you know, looked like a nice, happy dive. When they got out the water, or when they tried to get out the water, uh, 70 minutes later, so quite a long dive, when they when they got went to get out, um, the sea state had changed significantly, and now there was a bit of a swell. And where they were trying to get out the water, the combination of that one metre swell 
um, made it very difficult for them to get out the water. And there was a lot of splashing around and, um, you know, being hit and knocked around. Um, and this might sound like a very minor thing, but if any of you have tried to get out of the water um, in, in a one metre swell and you've got, you know, debris and um, and rocks and things like that, it's it's no joke. You really can hurt yourself. Um, thankfully, in this this situation, both divers managed to extricate themselves from the water without any serious injury, um, but they did lose some kit. Now, things that we might uh, might draw from this. Well, what level of planning had been conducted? Um, did that swell, a one meter swell, uh, suddenly sneak up on them, um, or would that have been forecast? Um, when they perhaps when they were planning, if they did indeed plan their dive, had they factored in that the weather might change? Had they adhered to the plan? Were, were they diving when they thought they were going to be diving? Um, you know, and then also perhaps they thought, who's to say that if they had factored the weather in and they thought that one meter was still fine, had they any mitigations in place? So uh, were there any other things that they could have done to make the getting out of the water easier, including ropes and things like that? Um, any number of things could have um, could have changed this um, this situation. The question that we should be thinking about is a lot of the things that would have would have changed this situation were uh, would have been based on planning, and we just don't know in this one what level of planning happened. But we could perhaps draw conclusions on if we were to do this ourselves and we planned it, could we have avoided? this and the the answer is quite possibly yes you could have avoided this situation um okay another example so we've got some equipment um so this one is a very classic uh scenario um so a diver uh, is um is underwater and then their weight belt starts to slip um and it all goes a bit peak tongue um and the 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 i think it's an instructor or a buddy tries to get the um tr tries to get them out of trouble in the best way that they can but it essentially it evolves into um a quick ascent um no adverse um effects were identified so thankfully no dci or anything like that um and it was reported that um, the diver had been trained to use both their BCD and dry suit for buoyancy control. Now, things that we can ask ourselves. So stuff that occurred to me, um, how detailed a buddy check was that? So when we do a buddy check, do we do we just glance over things or when we look at weight belts, do we think do we ask ourselves, is that weight belt tight enough? So just the presence of the thing, is that enough? Do we need to look into these in more detail? Um with um with the person's body shape, and I don't mean that in terms of were they um uh you, you know were they slim or overweight, it was more a case of some divers um have less hips to deal with um, holding a weight belt on. So if the person doesn't have hips in the same way as others, weight belts tend to slip. And a factor that feeds into that is how much weight's on the belt. So how, you know, if if I've got a diver going in with me and they've, they've got like 12, 14 kilos strung around their waist, I will be asking questions myself of whether or not that is the, the appropriate way of weighting themselves, or if they they can distribute that in a different manner while still still maintaining dumpable weight that will get them to the surface. So questions around were there were there alternatives to that person? Um, and and finally, you know, being trained to use BCD and dry suit, um, this you know that's up for debate. But for this particular individual, um, were they competent to use? two forms of buoyancy control at, at simultaneously. Now, some people can do that, other people can't. It, it then feeds into the task loading element. So um, if you're then if you're trying to look after your BCD buoyancy and then your dry suit, and then you're also having to wrestle and fight with a weight belt, these are three very complicated things to try and do simultaneously. 
So the, the, as you can see, there's lots of different elements that might feed into this one simple incident. So what does all of this tell us? Well, it tells us all sorts of stuff. But firstly, the, the big takeaway point that we need to we need to glean from the report is that, that diving is an incredibly safe sport. The number of incidents that happened uh, as, as a factor of the number of dives that are conducted every day, just within BZAC alone, but if we look at it worldwide, diving is incredibly safe. There's much more dangerous sports statistically out there. So, for instance, golf is statistically a terrible game because lots of people die on the course. It's not because of the golf, obviously. But this safety, it's not its not something that just happens. The safety of, of diving as a sport comes because we are very risk averse and we spend a lot of time training divers on how to approach problems and how to deal with them. Now, the majority of the incidents that we've looked at there, uh, and the majority of the incidents, if you read the whole incident report, appear to have one or more human factors at play. And the, the point is that we, if we can identify and try and reduce them, nip them in the bud, then there is going to be a benefit to that. There is going to naturally follow a reduction in the number of incidents if we all start to do these things. So there's there's lots there's so many incidents we've uh, sorry so many uh, factors out there. Um, I'm, I can't give you an answer for every single factor. How do you eliminate this? How do you eliminate that? There's a couple of easy ways that we can catch a lot of them. Um, and one which has been um, which is used extensively in, for instance, the air, airline industry or in the in flight industry, is checklists. Um, and the idea of a checklist is that it should be short and it should be super simple. So um, this one, I, I imagine, will be familiar to at least one person in the room this evening. Is a checklist that um, that airline captains use or flight crew use before they um before they get up into the air and that's for that's checklist for an, an airbus a, a, a passenger aircraft it's it's very simple um it's very effective and it does the job so we can see there's some very simple questions and they're really obvious some of them you know have this have these pins been removed is the parking brake on before you start the engine now You'd think, well, that's really, really simple, but that you know, there's a reason for that break to be on, and having that check there removes the risk of the the the, the resulting impact of it not being on. It's really straightforward stuff. So, how can we take that behaviour and apply it to our own? Um, so, here's something I can't remember who I pinched this off, but this is um, this. If you recognise the yellow, is off. The uh, it's off the inside of a, an AP um, rebreather, um, and this this person has got a, a list of checks that they do before they get in the water, um, and that's a, that's a really effective way of doing it. But this does come with some caveats. So it's all well and good creating a checklist, but you can't have a checklist which is five thousand points. It has to be simple to use. Shouldn't be a burden. The other way that we can make checklists more effective is not make them just something that you do on your own. Um, we can introduce a call and response. So, for instance, um, a good example of this in, in our club that we've done is we have checklists for um, before we take the boat out um, on the road, before we tow it out. We don't drive the boat on the road, but before we tow it out on the road and in a car, we have a checklist and it's a call and response. So it's actually, it's not one person just walking around ticking boxes. There is one person who is saying, has the thing been plugged in? Yes, check. Is the parking brake off? Check. Have the hubs been greased? Check. And it means that you don't skip over anything because, well, it's, you're much less likely to skip over anything because there's two people doing it. Um. It's also worth highlighting, and, and for those of you who are uh, instructors or, or, or aspiring to be instructors, use of checklists and reference materials in your day-to-day -day is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. 
Um, if I had a penny for every instructor that I'd come across who thought that they were above using slates to remember what they're supposed to be teaching, I'd not be a rich man, but I'd certainly have a few few dozen pennies at least. Using slates, using notes, using references is a good thing to do. Um, so please do do it. So if you think that you can increase your safety by creating a checklist, well, have a go at it, but stick to it. Don't, there's no point in making a checklist and then ignoring the thing, is there? Um, the other thing that's um, worth highlighting as a way to mitigate human factors, and it's sometimes easier said than done, um, is when the incident actually does occur, if I say when, if an incident does occur, um, is the the mantra, stop, breathe, think and act. Those pressures, those human factors that are um, that are applying to you in the midst of an incident will drive you down a path which is not the path you want to go down. And this is because you're reacting on instinct rather than analysing the situation. If you take a second to stop and breathe, well, first of all, you can breathe so the situation can't be the end of the world. So stop, breathe. Take a moment to think about how you're going to respond and then act. Stop, breathe, think and act. If you apply that simple mantra, you'll have a lot better resolution to an incident underwater. You'll have to trust me on that one. So learning from our mistakes. So, yeah, there's thousands of incidents uh, usually logged with BZAC over the years. Um, and. Each one of those lessons, each one of them is a lesson you can learn from. So by all means, dig, um, dig and dig and dig and, and read multiple years because you will see there are some things which form patterns um, and others which are very much out of the blue type incidences. Um, there's a quote here. Um, it is good to learn from your mistakes, but it's better to learn from other people's. Absolutely. Could not said it better myself. Um, and also a really important one, if you're if you're working your way through your diving career and you're making your way nicely along the Dunning-Kruger curve, if you were in the previous session, you'll know about that. If you're working your way along the Dunning-Kruger curve, you also need to bear in mind of your own fallibility. So overconfidence can hurt or kill you. It can hurt and kill others. This is a sign that I find particularly effective. Um, and it's um, the top fact on that sign is more than 300 divers, including open water scuba instructors, have died in cave uh, have died in caves just like this one. And I think that that extra bit, including open water scuba instructors, that addresses directly that um, that overconfidence, the bravado, because once you get to a certain level within any type of uh, activity that you undertake, you will get to a point where you think, I know it all. And this is probably fair to say I've been a newly qualified open water scuba instructor and I, I thought I was God's gift to diving at the time. And it, it, it's that sort of overconfidence that uh, will get you into trouble. So be quite humble about these things. OK. So we've come to the end of the session. I've done it nicely in an hour, which was good. Um, so. We've talked about why you should read the report. Hopefully there is some things in there that make you think I ought to read this from cover to cover. Um, we've talked about human factors and hopefully you've now come away with a bit of a better understanding or a, 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 at least a high level view of what human factors are and how we can apply them. And then we've taken those those factors. We've applied them to some examples, gone through and identified where human factors might have been at play, as well as just a couple of other factors, so environmental factors. And then we've talked about some simple things, some simple changes that you can make in your um, in your own in your own diving world that might mitigate some of these things. So um, before we move on to questions and I stop the recording, um, thank you for taking part um, and thank you for listening to me um, for the last hour. Um, and this will be available on the website in due course. Um, but yeah, if you've any questions, feel free to uh, drop us an email and uh, we can pick it up um, thereafter. So I'm going to stop the recording now. So good night.